Once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Village of Bartlett um, Committee of the Whole Meeting for February 6, 2024. I call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to again please call the roll. Trustee Daney? Here. Gansey? Here. Benstein? Here. Hopkins? Here. Lord? Here. Zawanski? Here. President Wallace? Here. Um, we'll start this meeting off with a town hall. If anyone would like to address the committee or any items on the committee, please uh, step, step up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and try to keep your comments for three minutes. Does anyone like to address the committee at this time? Does anyone online like to address the committee of the hall? No, Mayor. All right. We'll move on to standing committee reports, um, starting out with Community and Economic Development Committee, Chairman Gansey. Thank you, Mr. President. I have one item, strategic plan update. It's attached as a staff memo and a copy of the proposed updated strategic plan for 2024 to 2027. This memo provides a brief overview of the updated strategic plan for the village, incorporating input from the village board and department heads. The full plan is attached for detailed insights into short-term and long-term priorities, including communication strategies, business development initiatives, and infrastructure projects. I'll turn, turn it over to staff to go through that for us. Yeah, this evening is a brand new strategic plan um, for two reasons. One, because of all the goals that you've accomplished in the previous plan. And two is because the time frame of the plan is one to three years and three to five. So you'll see that same format uh, throughout the strategic plan, short term and long term, uh, routine and complex. And this plan includes a lot of the uh, common themes that you've seen in other plans, such as infrastructure, efficiency, safety, business retention, recruitment, and, and things of that nature throughout the plan. And also included uh, below some of those plans are bullet points that are uh, um, in addition to the overall theme of the plan. Um, and within that is also departmental responsibilities. You'll see that in green below each plan, and um, if you've got any further questions, we're happy to answer them. Sure. I, uh, looking over the plan, I know with the goal setting, for instance, increase Bartlett Hill's social media presence, I guess what I would like to see is like, what does increase mean? What does increase online marketing? I feel like we need to add either a percentage and then why? Like I know it says increase residence awareness. How are we going to measure that did increase their awareness? Sure. Ever since we started our social media platforms, we've been keeping track of numbers. Actually, one of those is within the activity measures that you're about to see in the budget presentation in March. Mm -hmm. But that, what you're saying there, was also discussed with A5, and that's been, going to become part of their rollout as well. So those types of facts and figures that you discussed just now will be a part of that process as well. So we're going to list it out somewhere so we know, like, can benchmark ourselves to where we're at? Um, in addition, um, we've revised the executive summaries that you get to include activity measures and connection to the um, um, strategic plan goals specifically, so that you'll be able to monitor each of those goals, each of activities that the board that is brought before the board and how it fits into the plan and the activity measure associated with it. Okay, thank you. And that'll be like included somewhere online for us like, to view, like a dashboard, like, kind of measuring where we're at? I think in terms of those medias, for, in terms of those numbers for the social media. Um, we I'm, could, I'm like we talking should. about every, like I, I feel like every goal on here with like the word increase or enhance. We did look at um, some dashboard programs. They were pretty expensive. Um, we were not really um, comfortable with um, the price of those, so we could work with GIS to build our own. Um, so I don't have something to show you right now, but um, I don't think it'll be um, too difficult to put together. We have looked at some in other communities, um, but we want to do that in-house because we think out-of-house is too expensive. Okay. And the longer we go with GoGov, some of that's happening organically with that system. So we'll continue to harness that, that platform as well. One of the things regarding the golf course, I, I agree with Trustee Gamsey trying to measure it, but we had talked about the, uh, our branding being incorporated into our golf course, uh, our branding campaign. And I just wanted to make sure we're not, going, we're not looking past that because I didn't see that actually in here. I saw a new website. I just want to make sure that that was part of that. 
Um, we met with uh, A5 last Friday, and they showed us some of the uh, overall concepts um, at, at the February 20th uh, Committee of the Whole. Um, they will unveil those concepts to you for your input, and we did discuss with them, including um, um, highlighting the golf course and also um, that connection to the entire community. Any other comments? Sorry, I'm not sure. All right. Well, then we will I guess we'll continue the strategic plan at a later time. I would just reiterate uh, Trustee Ganzi's point on things that are fluffy. That's how I usually relate to them. They're fluffy and specific strategic goals, and they shouldn't. I know they have to be fluffy on here because it's just bullet points. But it's specifically, um, when we get to the nuts and bolts of specific it all, measurable. Yeah, specific measurables around each one of these strategic goals would, would help um, all of us to understand how we're pro proceeding to the end goal. So, anything else? The more knowledge, the better. The more data. Thank you, Chairman Ganzi. License and Ordinance Committee, Chairman Hopkins. Thank you, President Wallace. We have one item on our agenda, and that's regulating unscheduled bus drop-offs. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt, our village attorney, to explain how we got here, the reason for drafting this, and give us his legal opinion. Certainly. Um, as the board's probably aware, there's been a lot of um, issues in the suburban communities lately with unscheduled drop-ups of, uh, unfortunately, migrants who are coming from the south. Uh, now that the landing zone in Chicago has been full and Chicago's taken a harder stance. Um, several suburban communities have adopted ordinance essentially prohibiting these bus drop-offs. They seem to occur around metro stations and they're, um, these individuals are dropped off so that they can be bused into the city and reach the landing zone in the city of Chicago. Uh, several different types of ordinances have been adopted by communities. Some, you know, have an outright ban. Some have a uh, approval process. Some communities have decided not to take any action um, and just kind of wait and see and have more of an administrative plan in place on how to respond if we do have a drop off. Uh, I believe we already have a plan in place uh, for how we would handle one of these if it does happen in Bartlett. Uh, we did prepare a draft ordinance with what we think is the most defensible option if the board wants to adopt an ordinance prohibiting these types of uh, unscheduled bus drop offs. There's no obligation, there's no um, necessity from a legal perspective, it's entirely a policy decision up to the village board, but we wanted to at least have a draft ordinance for the board to consider if the board did think that this was something they wanted to pursue. Uh, the draft ordinance that we put together is a pre-approval process so that a bus just can't show up unannounced and uh, unload a bus of individuals and without anything set up for how they're going to get to the city of Chicago. So it requires somebody to apply for pre-approval, and if they drop off um, without that approval, then we can cite them. Um, there isn't really anything much we can do besides issuing them a ticket. So I, if there's any questions about the specifics of the draft ordinance and how that works, I'm certainly happy to ask or uh, to answer any questions on that. It's really more of a question if the board wants to pursue any of these regulations or not. Um, as far as um, municipalities or cities that have adopted this, are they using any legal resources or any dollars to defend it? So the city of Chicago adopted an ordinance that's somewhat similar to this where they have um, a prohibition on unscheduled drop-offs and that they have to get pre-approval to uh, drop off a uh, load of passengers. That ordinance is now challenged. Uh, there is a lawsuit pending. Uh, the bus company is claiming that prohibiting these drop-offs violates the Commerce Clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. So these types of ordinances are still new. It's uh, obviously a new issue that everybody's grappling with. How far municipalities can go to regulate them is still somewhat of an open question, given that there is this lawsuit involving the city of Chicago. How long do you think that um, 
is going to take to get resolved? It's hard to predict how long litigation can take, um, depending on the type of case and how fast it can move. I mean, sometimes a year, two years. So, so if there, Chicago, though, is that lawsuit because they're prohibiting people from dropping off or prohibiting from dropping off after certain time periods? So they have a pre-approval process uh, that's somewhat similar to this, and that's being challenged altogether. They're saying that you can't treat our drop-offs differently than any other type of, you know, passenger service coming into the city. So for the sake of clarification, a scheduled versus an unscheduled drop-off is? Who schedules? That is that our decision whether it's scheduled or not? So the way that we've defined it is that it has to be a published schedule so that everybody can look at it. So the classic example would be a metro schedule or a Greyhound schedule or a pace schedule that says this is when this bus is going to be here and this is when that bus is going to be here. So that way there's some expectation of we know there's going to be people around here. We're going to have resources in place. We know what to expect not to have somebody dropping off in the middle of the night without any resources. Greyhound doesn't drop here. Certainly. Greyhound drops in Elgin, correct? Yeah. And, and Chicago, but they're not dropping here, generally speaking, before this issue. Would that be correct? Yes. So this is something over and above that the different municipalities are having to deal with. Yes. And we do not have the resources for this. No. No. Are they classifying this as mass transit? I mean, are we... Not necessarily. Uh, we, we define this as like an inner city bus, meaning any bus service that's originating from outside of the village with 10 or more passengers. Which is scheduled. Off here. Which is always scheduled. Yeah. If that's scheduled, then that's, that's okay. That's permitted here. So when the bus drops off in Bartlett and 50, 60 passengers get out, uh, what's, what's to say they are all getting on the train and how are they getting on the train? What's the financial means to get on the train? That's something that we really can't control. Um, and that's uh, one of the drawbacks of this. It's, it's obviously a tough situation and most municipalities, all municipalities don't have a lot of the same tool, the necessary tools to deal with those more logistical issues. What we can regulate is where buses can be dropped off and how that process works. So what happened was when Chicago instituted this ordinance, that's when these buses started going to the collar metro stations from Cary to Elburn and the easiest point of exiting or drop off. Uh, so as more and more of these municipalities start instituting this, less and less opportunities to drop off, but they're going to challenge more of them. That's very possible, yes. Let me ask, so let's say hypothetically we uh, establish an ordinance against this and they're fined, you know, and it's a drop off, the bus is gone. How are we going, if we did find them, how we, I, I think we're spinning our wheels. They can just tell us we're not paying it. You know, sue me. You know, I'm not paying it. And I'm we could certainly issue a ticket and take them into adjudication, but yeah. collecting on it could be challenging in some instances. It would be. Yeah. How does that affect, it? if you know, if a, a bus company that was hired by a certain, by an NGO is dropping off unscheduled, making unscheduled drops at various municipalities in Chicago, and let's just say it's ABC bus company hired by ABC NGO, at what point do citations that were issued affect that bus company's um, standing? Does it at all? I mean, are, are those, is there a paper trail that well, this bus company has X amount of, of unpaid citations out there across the country? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could certainly try and collect on them as much as you can. Is, is, there, a, is there a trail? I mean, like, is there a, a record? Like, if, you, if, if, you're, a, if, you're, a, if you're an over-the-road trucker, Safer <laughs> keeps track of all of your citations, right? Is there a... Oh, is there, a, a, like, a central database for municipal citations? That I, I'm not aware of. I think that... I mean, obviously, any citation we issue would be a public record, so it would be easy to, for somebody to obtain, uh, but I'm not aware of any central system <coughs> uh, ordinance violations like that. Right. Um, Paula, have we had any issues thus far or any of our surrounding neighbors had any issues at their metro stations or drop-offs? Um, we have had uh, one drop-off uh, on Christmas Eve 
that you'll remember. Um, those um, folks got off the bus, got onto the train, and um, headed to Chicago. Uh, we opened the train station for them. The police department responded. Um, we opened the train station so that they could use the bathroom. And then they, um, I think they arrived, Jeff, like 15 minutes before the uh, train was to head to Chicago. So they were not in town very long. Um, our, our neighbors, um, um, it varies. So um, in DuPage County, there's been quite a few. Um, but it's been a little random in terms of which stations they go to. There's no really pattern. I will tell you some of our um, neighbors in DuPage County, they have construction around their uh, train station, so they haven't been visited. But um, places like um, Naperville, where they have three stations, they have had more drop-offs than um, Elmhurst has had more drop-offs. So some communities have had more than others. Um, a few months ago, um, when we were talking about this um, in a manager's meeting, Hanover Park had not had a drop-off. So um, that's not to say that they won't, or they haven't had it since that conversation, but um, there's no real pattern. So I know Auburn had 11 yeah. as of last two weeks ago. I had 11 drop-offs just this year or within the last month or so. Um, a question for Chief. During that uh, drop-off on New Year's Eve, um, obviously you guys weren't, or Christmas Eve, you guys weren't made aware of that, correct, prior? Yeah, that is correct. They didn't give us a prior notification that they were here. I believe we learned about it from either another commuter or one of our residents. As uh, Paula mentioned, uh, we went, we went over there. Um, they had a sponsor on their bus that provided them with paid tickets to use the Metro train. So the only thing we really did was facilitate, as Paula mentioned, is opening up the Metro station. So in case they needed to keep warm or in case they had to use the uh, facilities. So and then as Paula mentioned, within 15 minutes, all of them got on the train. That said, it's, it's definitely easier to manage our police force if we do have advanced knowledge of them or schedule going, you know, down the line if this starts to uh, creep up more consistently. Oh. We're prepared whichever direction the board wants to go. Um, if we go to the direction where it's scheduled, you know, there's so many different bus companies coming out of Texas that there's no guarantee that they would notify us. But whether they do or not, um, it's not really a burden on our police department because literally, at least at this time, we're just opening up the metro station just so they can use the facilities, stuff like that. Now, where it would become a burden is if they weren't provided the prepaid tickets to get on the metro train, just trying to find the resources, our community partners, to get them those train tickets to get on there. How do we find out who's paying for these buses? The one concern. The NGOs are paying for them. The one concern yeah. that. Names. Yeah, the one concern. Great. Oh. Yes, a question. Oh, I thought it was answered. No. I'm, I'm just I'm curious how we get this messaging and enforce this. Um, some um, police departments, you know, have interviews of the people on the bus. They ask, you know, where'd you come from? How'd you get here? You know, who's providing your ticket? Um, some of the um, reporting requirements require that um, that there is someone on the bus who is a liaison. Um, that is, you know, that that information is not provided to us ahead of time. Um, you know, would that be something we ask? It's we done. No, who's paying for it? An interview. It's asked, you know, um, at the station on the bus. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know if we could compel them, Kurt. To yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have any real ba legal basis to force them to say who's paying for would the they, tickets. Would they know? They might not know. They and don't even know. If somebody I think from, unfortunately, for our perspective, if we're trying to control what happens after they land, we might not be able to work that into the ordinance because 
how they got here and who's paying for them. We would certainly be able to ticket the bus company, but I don't know how we'd be able to get to who's chartering the bus company. That might be beyond our purview. Why would that be? Our, so we can certainly find out what NGO is footing the bill to ship them everywhere. There's we could. Probably half a dozen of them down in Texas that non-governmental organizations that are probably doing that. And if we were going to address something to be sure that we had forewarning that anything that was coming our way, you would think you would want to get our ordinance drafted to cite the NGO versus uh, NGO and the bus company. So we... The mayor is basically saying what, what I wanted to say earlier. It does, there doesn't seem to be a concern... It, 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 there doesn't seem to be a concern at this time. But if it gets to the point that we do have a situation, I think that uh, maybe we should take a look at this and put something in place at this point in time and not wait until you know, we're, we're pushed into it. So. I'd like to see um, something that addresses the safety of the Bartlett residents and the Bartlett police. Uh, we're assuming it's going to be a mom, dad, and kid getting off the bus. What if it's a 35-year-old military-trained uh, illegal alien and there's 50 of them. We saw what young s students or kids, teenagers, young adults were doing to the city of Chicago three years ago with the rioting and the vandalism and the damage. My business was damaged uh, several times during the summer of love. And so I would also like a worst case scenario looked at as well. So for, you know, if it's mom, dad, child, Yes, hopefully there's no, there's no incidences, but what if it's 50, 35-year-old men that are military trained that are getting off the bus in Bartlett? I'm concerned about my daughters. I'm concerned about my wife. I'm concerned about our businesses. And again, it might be an extreme case, but I think we should be aware of that as well. And I don't want to see our police officers getting injured either. Well, I don't think you have to go back three years. I think you just have to go back a week ago in New York City. Yeah, yep. So, Trustee LaPorte's point, what, what could we do if something like that happens? I think you're talking about a riot situation. Well, they're dropping 50 people off, potentially more, you know, yeah, unannounced. There's been a lot of these drop-offs throughout the, um, you know, Chicago suburbs, and there has been no situations that we're aware of so far. Just like anywhere that would happen in Bartlett, we have policies and procedures and we have mutual aid policies uh, with local jurisdictions and then we have ILEAS callouts and NIPAS callouts where we can get multiple officers here in a very timely fashion if that would ever come to be. But from what we're seeing from speaking to our um, community police departments and what Paula sees from her groups, most of these people just come on over here and then they get on the train without causing any type of issue whatsoever. I understand that, but the point remains is the potential exists that this could occur, and I would like to see something in place before you know it's before we have to deal with the situation before it's too late, so to speak. I'd like to see something in place at this point in time so we have some direction. We know exactly, specifically what we what we need to do. Does our village manager and our village attorney recommend that we put something in place ahead of time? Good question. It's really a policy decision for the board, um, at least from a legal perspective. Uh, again, there's several, many communities that are deciding to just adopt an action plan for how they respond um, without an ordinance. Other communities have decided that they want to put an ordinance in place. So that decision is really a policy decision for the board. I just, uh, um, I think what um, is before you is appropriate for what we are experiencing, for what we have experienced. Um, I would just not want to be the last community on the train line that doesn't have an ordinance. Yeah. So to your point, um, I think proactive is better than reactive. Uh, I think it is a measured step that we're taking and it's an appropriate one. Um, I will also tell you that some, of, uh, some municipalities are um, sending copies of their uh, ordinances to the state of Texas so that they can disseminate that and they have been um, they've had some success so it takes a little more of a, um, a proactive a approach where the bus companies are are hesitant to come to a community that has a structure in place 
when they can go just down the road to somebody who doesn't. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I would like to see a little more teeth in this, um, adding the state of Texas as a part of this ordinance saying, you know, we're going to hold you responsible. The NGOs, if we can ever track them down, we're going to hold you responsible and send that down and say, hey, you know. See how far we can take it. Yeah. Yeah. Would it be stronger if we had a, an alliance with the neighboring communities, Streamwood or, uh, sorry, Hanover Park and Roselle, where the ordinances lined up a little bit and <laughs> took it at, a, at an approach kind of like we're doing for the train merger? Um, we had kind of talked about that with the conferences, and each community is very distinct on where they land on this. And so I think getting an overall um, blanket kind of joint resolution or ordinance I think might be a big stretch. Can we hear about what some of the other neighboring communities are putting together? Oh, yeah. We have. Um, we have studied them. Um, we've uh, had some... The conference has been really great at, at putting those um, databases together for us. And then how about with the conferences, are they putting pressure in other areas, like working with you know, senators and other legislators? Um, I believe they are, are um, both conferences are part of the working group um, through the um, mayor's caucus. And that has direct pipeline to um, our representatives, as well as the city of Chicago and the Cook County um, boards. Just one last point. Under our, under uh, Steve Laporte and Swansky's questioning of, you know, somebody getting off of their uh, causing, you know, riot activities, have we updated or have you looked at or is it inclusive in our emergency response plan that we have that we've gone over a couple of times? Has that been updated to kind of like add this into that? Should something like that happen? Or are we already covered under that? When we had, um, and, and Chief, maybe you can help me remember, when um, during the pandemic, when um, a lot of our neighbors were having um, smash and grab robberies, there, were, there was, you know, um, um, protests, um, concerns about, you know, coming out on the train, um, we did a number of uh, tabletops and scenarios for dealing with like a mob action or um, violent groups. And, and Chief, if, I don't know if you'd like to elaborate on that, but that is something that we had considered fairly recently. Okay. Yeah, just to just be, I believe if I'm correct, we had discussed that with staff right prior to this last 4th of July event because we were very concerned. That's correct. Yeah. As you are aware, our emergency plan is um, very updated. Uh, Commander Rybaski did a really nice job working with Sam Hughes, um, and it was actually complemented actually by some of the other county agencies. So whether a riot would happen at a train station or it would happen elsewhere, we are well prepared to handle that based on our policies and procedures, not only of the village emergency plan, but also too from our policies and procedures of the police department. And then also too, I know that Sam and Kyle have been in touch with our community partners um, just looking for different type of resources or plans of action in case things have changed in regard to like, for instance, lodging and stuff like that. So we're very well versed on what our plan would be in case they don't have tickets to get on the train or they don't want to leave. Um, we would just work with our community partners over in DuPage County, King County, and Cook County to facilitate that. If I'm not mistaken, during the pandemic when we had the peaceful protest, a lot of businesses shut down. Home Depot closed, uh, Jewel closed, BMO Bank closed. Most of the building, or most of the, and it was a peaceful protest and we were very fortunate, but that wasn't what was going on at that time in Chicago and other places, which is why we reacted the way we did. I guess my, again, I'm going, to the extreme, but if 50 35-year-old uh, men get off of a bus and start wreaking havoc, are we prepared for that? I don't even think that's not even, this ordinance doesn't cover that. That's well, if you have a five-day notice like we are proposing here, then we could be prepared for the worst case scenario five days later. If it's a sudden drop-off and they don't adhere to the five-day, then none of this is relevant. 
I mean, I just look at this and I'm like, if we pass an ordinance, are we willing to spend resources to defend it if we get sued? We're going to spend resources. I think the city of Chicago hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend their ordinance. So are we ready as a board to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend it? Or are we going to back down? What are you willing to do? That's, that's the, the question, I think. Let me, in, in regards to that, Trustee Hopkins, let me ask Kurt a question. Is there a lawsuit? Does, does any, any part of Chicago's structure warrant them to be sued for what they're doing, like their sanctuary city status? Does that have anything to do with it? Yeah, because they receive money. Uh, the, the lawsuit that I've seen is based more on just basic, this violates the Commerce Clause. You can't prevent people from going in and out of states like this. Um, so I, I, you know, what the motives of the people that filed the lawsuit, I can't say. Obviously, there could have been other motives behind it. What the language says, it's just basically saying you can't prevent me from coming into your city based on the way the Constitution is written. I think so we maybe, maybe we re retool this ordinance and, and guide it toward the, the transportation people and say there are not we are not, you are not allowed to drop off any amount of people on an unscheduled stop or a scheduled stop without our approval. That would be directly at the transportation company. So this this the way that we have it drafted now it does aim directly at the bus company that's dropping it off unscheduled. Um, we could try and look to tweak it as much as we can. I think any any ordinance that we're going to be able to put in place is going to impact arguably interstate commerce, so I think we would still face that same risk. But we think this, it, at least this way, having a pre-approval process, that's more narrowly tailored to, you know, preventing those mm -hmm. impacts on public health safety. Welfare. I agree with that. We're not saying they can't. We're not saying they can't, saying they can't. We're saying they you just have to get pre approved. I agree with that. So we think that's why this is a more defensible position than a blanket ban. Because if you had a blanket ban, that's more likely to be challenged. The reason Chicago is getting sued is because they received a ton of money from the government to be a sanctuary city, and then they're saying that you can't drop off here. So that's part of the reason that people are uh, suing them, you know, part of it. Not saying that we wouldn't be subject to it, you know, Trustee Hopkins might have a valid point that we could, somebody could get, you know, pissed off enough to do it, but uh, I think that the way it's written, the way I read it is, doors open, just got to call ahead. That's how I read that. Yeah. Well, I think Paula described it correctly, and I believe we need an ordinance, but I think you phrased it be proactive rather than reactive. So that being said, I couldn't have described it any better, and that's exactly the way I feel. I think we should be proactive and not reactive. We need to have something. And we are not saying no. We're just saying, you know, give us a five-day notice. So this, this would apply if a bus of people were dropped off for a train pub crawl in Bartlett. And technically, yes, if they didn't come, sure if it was more than ten, everything is enforced. Yeah, so and we have some exceptions in there for school buses and for you know, there's uh, busing for disabled people, things of that nature. So we have some exceptions in there so that it doesn't encompass some of those more common busing um, situations that we would see. But it's there are probably going to be some unintended consequences, as there is with any type of order. But then, so those people would be fined. The bus company would be. The bus company would. Well, I think if they're going to drop off 100 people for a pub crawl in Bartlett, most of the businesses around the downtown Bartlett would pay the fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I think that becomes the question. Now you're discriminating. Yeah. Not voluntarily paying anybody's fines, not discriminating. And where you're coming up with that. Anyway, I think more questions from the committee. I don't think so, but it sounds to me like we should probably put something on the board meeting next time and and vote on it. Um, so we have something in the books. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I'd like more information before I would. Yeah, I, I would be a no because I'm not willing to sink my teeth into a hundred thousand dollar lawsuit because we have. I mean, we've had one bus drop off. It was peaceful. We have sidewalks to fix. We have so many other things to do besides defend from a potential lawsuit from this. So that's just my stance on it. So let's get it to the next board meeting. Is my it'll be a no vote. We can discuss it at the next board meeting too.
That's all we have on the licenses and ordinances tonight. Thank you, Chairman Hopkins. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. You so moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Daney, seconded by Trustee Laporte. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Daney? Yes. Yenzi? Yes. Christine? Yes. Hopkins? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Zelensky? Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you, thank you. No filibuster tonight. <laughs> Yeah. yeah.